now. Oh, I'm sure most of you'd rather I just kept it turned off, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't expect to get a yell on that one. Uh, it's good to see all of you this morning. Hope you've had a great week. It's great that we can uh, gather together here. The weather is turning cooler, which is great. Uh, we're hoping and praying for snow next week. Uh, so uh, at the rate it's going. But it's good to have all of you here. want to welcome you to our service of worship. We especially want to welcome those of you who are viewing us uh, online on our Facebook page. We're glad that you're worshiping with us as well. And we come together today as a family of faith uh, just to celebrate God and to celebrate being a part of a family of faith. It's good to see uh, all of you here. Just a few announcements I'd like to uh, bring before you. Um, as you know, Halloween is just around the corner, and on Friday, October the 30th, beginning at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a drive through trick-or-treat here at our church, and we need your help, okay? We need you to bring bags of candy with you, if you can, as many bags as we can collect. We don't know how many to expect, but... Uh, we're hoping to have a, a, a large number, and if you will bring your candy here, you can bring it on Sunday mornings and leave it back there in the back. You can bring it to the church office. Now, let me tell you something about the candy. Bring any kind of candy you want to bring, okay? But if your candy has Reese's peanut butter cups in the bag, that's been scientifically shown not to really agree with the digestive systems of young children. So... Just take the Reese's peanut butter cups out and bring those to me, okay? And we'll put them in the church office and we'll figure out something to do with them. But bring your candy with you because we're going to have some fun uh, with this. Also, you know that it's a tradition to this church to furnish Thanksgiving food baskets uh, to folks uh, who could uh, use a nice Thanksgiving meal. We're collecting non perishable items uh, and monetary donations. We're going to be giving a $10 Walmart gift card along with the food basket. So if you can contribute to that, we've got a wonderful table uh, set up in the back. Uh, folks are already bringing it, and that's great. That's great. We're going to uh, use those uh, to help out some folks uh, during Thanksgiving. So remember that. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest. Is it illegal to decorate your house for Christmas before Halloween? Yes. yes. Okay. It is illegal to decorate your house for Christmas before Halloween, according to our poll here. Okay. But now let me ask you another question. How many of you have already started some of your Christmas shopping? Uh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, yep. Well, I want to remind you of this, okay? When you're doing your Christmas shopping, if you shop online, especially with Amazon, go to Amazon Smile and do that shopping because a portion of everything that you spend on Amazon Smile, a portion of that comes back to our church, so if you'll list the New Life Community Church of Luling, if you'll list that in your Amazon Smile, you'll be giving to your church as well as giving to your loved ones and your friends during Christmas. So remember that uh, when you're doing all that Christmas shopping. And Cindy and I will be decorating our house on November the 1st, which is the day after Halloween, because she would do it before Halloween if we could. <laughs> uh, we have uh, gathered here today to worship. It's a great day for us to be together. So let's begin our time together by joining together in a spirit of prayer. Let's pray together. Mighty God, we give you thanks for what you have put on our plate today. Grace, love, celebration, and praise. We pray that all of this would nurture our hearts and our spirits as we worship in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is a wonderful uh, hymn of faith. Uh, stand up, stand up for Jesus. We're going to stand together and join in singing.
can be seated. As we come to this time now in our service of worship uh, to turn to our Lord in prayer, uh, as always when we gather together as a family of faith, we want to lift up those folks in our church family, uh, our friends and our loved ones who are in need of our prayers today in a special way. Uh, first and foremost, as most of you know, we lost one of our uh, newest saints in God's kingdom this week. Uh, Denver King passed away. And uh, Janet and I have spent a lot of time together this week. And uh, we are going to be meeting on Tuesday to plan a memorial service uh, for Denver. Uh, that'll happen in the next, uh, we don't know, two to three weeks. But we'll be letting you know when that's going to happen. And we're going to do everything in our power uh, that we can to have that service right here where Denver would have wanted it. Uh, in this sanctuary with friends and loved ones gathering. We're going to go to a tremendous lengths. Uh, to make that happen. So keep that in mind. And let's remember Miss Janet uh, in our prayers uh, during this time. We also uh, want to remember Marlon Bell's mother. Uh, she had another fall over the weekend and is now hospitalized. Uh, this is like the third or fourth fall she's had in the last few weeks. And so we want to remember Marlon, his mom, and his family in our prayers. As well, I uh, had a, a good visit with Bruce Madden this week. Um, a number of his family members came off the COVID positive list, but then others went right back on it. And so uh, we want to remember Bruce and, uh, and his family uh, as they're struggling with this right now. Frank Whiteside is going to be having surgery again on his back in the next couple of weeks. And so we want to uh, remember Frank in our prayers. And as well, of course, we continue to remember Seal uh, Callier and Patricia Zirkle as they continue to recover and uh, do you have anyone uh, in your family or a loved one that you would like to remember in prayer today? Just lift their name up. Say their name aloud at this time. Well, let's turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, as we come to you in prayer, we remember all of these that we've mentioned here today. And we pray that your loving and healing spirit might touch them in all the ways that they need. We lift up our own concerns to you and we ask that you would continue to touch and bless our lives. Not only as we look to you for hope and peace, but also as we celebrate your blessings in our lives. Dear God, when you... When you walked this earth, days were much simpler. A day's journey was measured by footsteps rather than speed limits. To talk to someone was to be within touching distance. To look into the eyes of the other person. Today we talk through faxes and car phones, satellites and social media. Never really touching, becoming faceless with one another like voices crying out in a wilderness. We envy your simple world for ours has become so complex. The distractions are so many. A virus. Hurricanes. Elections. Social unrest, many things are competing for our attention. We've become accustomed to being easily distracted and it's become easier to look about us rather than to look up for, for comfort and it's easier to look around us than to look inward for meaning. Dear God, in our busy, cluttered world, we long to see your face, to hear simple words of Love and healing. To find a quiet place in your arms. To be touched by your grace. To be heard. Without having to yell. So this is our prayer for this hour of worship. And for each and every day of our lives. Keep our minds on you so that we might know your peace. Open our eyes to your love that we might see your beauty. Quiet our hearts so that we can hear your voice. 
This is our prayer in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray when he prayed these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we're going to offer to God the best of our giving, our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. In order to do so, you are welcome to bring your gift and place it here in the altar and plate on the altar. We have another plate in the back. Let me remind you that we have our online giving program. Many of you are taking advantage of that, and we appreciate that. Uh, and if you would like to use that as a method of your giving, we encourage everyone to give of their very best so that we can uh, move to a strong ending of this year. So at this time, uh, let's uh, take the time to offer our best in giving to God. <clears throat> As we sing this song, um, I want you to participate with us and pr sing praises to God. You know, it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I don't care if you sing really low or really high or somewhere in between or just way off. It doesn't matter. God hears our praise. And um, I can't help but think during all these times how great he is. And that's what this song is about. Real easy to sing. So just um, please join us. Our hearts 
This morning I'm reading from Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observing those who live according to the example you have in us. For many, uh, for many live, live, <laughs> excuse me, for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm in awe. 
Thank you, Paul and Beth. Would you join with me in a spirit of prayer? Almighty God, we pray now in these moments that the power of your spirit would fill our hearts. Fill these words so that we might be touched with your message for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a young lady who was a bridesmaid at her best friend's wedding. And when the wedding was over, they were at the reception. And she just became intrigued by the wedding cake. It was one of the prettiest wedding cakes she had ever seen. And she loved the wedding cake. She especially loved this inscription that had been placed on the cake. The inscription read 1 John 4.18. Which reads, there is no fear in love, but love drives out all fear. She loved that saying of 1 John 4.18 on a wedding cake. She was so intrigued by it that she took out her cell phone and she took a picture of the cake. Because in her mind she was thinking, when it comes time for me to get married, I want an exact imitation of this cake at my wedding. So she took a picture of it with her cell phone and she saved it. A couple of years later, she became engaged and it became time to, to prepare her wedding. And so one of the first things she did was she made a, a photograph of the picture that she had on her phone of this wedding cake. You know, with that, with that, uh, with that scripture on there, 1 John 4, 18. And she took it to the baker and she said, I want an exact imitation of this cake. Can you do it? And the baker said, sure, I can do it. No problem. Well, the writing on the picture on the cake was a little bit fuzzy. And the baker was struggling a little bit to make it out. But she gave it her best shot. When this woman's wedding day rolled around, the wedding went off without a hitch. They showed up at the reception. And the first thing she wanted to see was her wedding cake. But it was far from a direct imitation of the one her friend had had. Because you see, the baker didn't realize that there was a one in front of John 4.18. So instead of inscribing on her wedding cake, First uh, uh, John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but love drives out all fear. Her wedding cake read, John 4.18. You have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. <clears throat> you know, folks, there are times when an imitation can have wonderful results. And then there are times when attempts at imitation can be disastrous. I think Paul might have had this in mind when he wrote this letter to the Philippians. Because in this passage we read today, Paul writes, listen, when you live your lives, imitate people like me. Imitate the disciples of Christ. For we have been called to imitate Christ himself. He said, imitate us. And the followers of Christ. Don't imitate the enemies of the cross. He says don't imitate the enemies of the cross. Who are the enemies of the cross? That Paul is writing about here. Well he says it. He says the enemies of the cross are those whose God is their belly. And whose shame is their glory. 
The enemies of the cross are those whose God is their belly and whose shame is their glory. Now, at first glance, we may think what Paul is saying here is that the enemies of the cross are those folks who, who are outside the church, who are gluttonous, and all they're interested in is satisfying themselves. And when he says the, uh, the, the uh, enemies of the cross are those whose shame is their glory, we may think Paul is talking about those folks outside the church who are living unholy lives and just trying to draw attention to themselves. That's not the people Paul is talking about in this passage. In this passage, when Paul speaks of the enemies of the cross, he's not talking about people outside the church. No, for Paul, the enemies of the cross were some of the folks inside the church. For Paul, the enemies of the cross were folks inside the church whose God was their belly. He's referring here to the Jewish food laws and the Jewish uh, dietary laws that many in the new church were reluctant to give up. All of us remember uh, back during Jesus' day, uh, the Jewish faith had strict religious food laws that they had to follow. There were certain things you could eat and there were certain things you couldn't eat. And if you ate the things that you were allowed to eat, you remained in a right relationship with God. But if you ate the things that were forbidden, you would lose your relationship with God. And there were many in the Christian church, especially in the church of Philippi, who were reluctant to let go of their belief in those religious food laws. They were reluctant to embrace the work that Jesus had done on the cross. And they were holding on to their faith in these food laws. To keep them in a right relationship with God. Their God was their belly. Their God was their belly. And then he says the enemies of the cross are people whose glory is their shame. What he's referring to here are the Jewish circumcision laws that existed back in this day. When a Jewish child was born within eight days of his birth, he was required to be circumcised. And when a person, when a man wanted to go to the temple to worship, and remember back then, women weren't allowed in church. Okay, women weren't allowed in the temple back then. We men have learned our lesson, okay? And we have learned it painfully, okay? Women weren't allowed in the temple back then. But the men who would want to go to the temple to worship, they first had to prove that they were circumcised in order to get in. And the way they would do it was simple. They'd make them stand right out there on the... Steps of the temple and prove that they were circumcised. They had to prove they were circumcised in order to experience the glory of worship. We got any visitors here today? No, 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 no. We won't go there. <laughs> But this is what was happening back then. They would stand on the steps of the temple and prove. They would have to go through the shame of proving that they were circumcised in order to experience the glory of worship. Their shame was their glory. And Paul said that these folks who were holding on to these circumcision laws as an entrance into worship. And in the Philippian church, there were still those who were holding on to this. They didn't feel like anyone who was uncircumcised should be able to worship in their church. They wanted the, just the circumcised folks in there. They were holding on to their religious belief in the circumcision laws as a way to ensure your relationship with God. Paul says, these folks are enemies of the cross. Those whose God is their belly. Those whose shame is their glory. They are enemies of the cross. 
Because they're not embracing the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. In order to have a relationship with God. They're embracing their religious activity. And they're still believing that their religious rules and regulations. And their religious laws were going to keep them in a right relationship with God. Paul says don't imitate the enemies of the cross. Don't imitate those folks. Instead, imitate folks like me and the disciples of Jesus Christ. A couple of months ago, when I was moving into the office here in the church, I had all of my boxes that I had packed up from my old office. I had sold off most of my, well, really didn't sell it off, I gave off most of my library. To some of our seminary students and, and all this. And uh, I kept a few books. Of course, I didn't get, a, get rid of any of my LSU memorabilia. My New Orleans Saints memorabilia. You know, okay. I've got eight or ten Bibles in my office right now. I've got 30 or 40 things from LSU. But I was unpacking all of those boxes in the office. And I was getting it all you know, out, and I got down to the last box, which is basically full of a bunch of, of old files and some old information that I wanted to save and bring from my office. And as I got to the bottom of the box, I came across this. This, uh, the, uh, this is the headline from the religion section of the Baton Rouge Morning Advocate from July 1993. And it's a headline that was announcing all of the new appointments the Methodist ministers, uh, all the new Methodist churches in Baton Rouge are going to be receiving uh, Methodist ministers. And if you look at this article, that's me right there. That's my picture. And when I pulled this out of the box, the first thing I noticed was this. I still have my hair. <laughs> I still have all my hair. I'm oh boy, it was really thick back then. And Cindy will tell you, I, I love my hair more than I love my children. Um, but anyway, it's a picture of me and my dear colleague, Rod Kennedy. They featured us in the article. And in this article, it talks about how I was about to be appointed to be the new pastor at the St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. Now, folks, there's something you need to understand. Back then, there were two St. Luke's United Methodist Churches in Baton Rouge. There was the St. Luke's United Methodist Church on Aletha Drive. That was the church I was going to. And it was predominantly white. And then there was the St. Luke's United Methodist Church on Greenwell Springs Road. And it was predominantly black. Well, I didn't notice it. Nobody I knew noticed it. But the article that came out before the first Sunday we were supposed to uh, appear in our new churches... The article came out and said that I was going to be, I was appointed as the new pastor of the St. Luke's United Methodist Church on Greenwell Springs Road, which was the predominantly black church. Well, I showed up at St. Luke's on Aletha Drive that morning. We had our first worship service. It went off great. I, I was so excited. This was the first church I was going to serve as the pastor in charge. When I got home later that afternoon, my district superintendent, Dr. George Calvin, he's resting in heaven now, but Dr. George Calvin was my district superintendent. He called me up. He said, Mishy, how did it go today? I said, oh, it went great. It went great. I loved it. The people were wonderful. I'm, I'm going to be happy there. He said, well, that's good. He said, because I want you to know, they had standing room only at the other St. Luke's Methodist Church today. I said, really? He said, yeah. All those folks showed up to see what this new white preacher was going to do uh, in their black church. And we laughed about that. This article came out uh, three weeks before I was going to my first communion service there at St. Luke's. That first communion Sunday rolled around. And it was time to serve communion. And uh, the elements had been prepared. I told the communion steward would handle all of that. And so I undraped the elements. I consecrated the elements. And then I turned around and I asked the, for the person who's going to be assisting me in the sacrament. If they would please come forward. And nobody moved. Nobody moved. 
They all sat still. And I'm looking around thinking, you know, surely the communion steward recruited somebody to help me serve communion today. She hadn't done that. So I'm wondering, okay, what am I going to do now? So I turned up to the choir and I looked at the choir with this panicked look on my face. And Henry Hansen stood up. Henry, a good old man, you know, he's a great guy. Sang in the choir, very active in that church. Henry stood up and said, I'll help you, preacher. So he came down and I served Henry communion. I gave him a piece of bread and I handed him a cup. And then I took a piece of bread and I took a cup. We celebrated the sacrament together. And then I handed him a tray of juice and I took the bread and we went down to the altar and the people started to come. And of course, I was the new preacher, so we were packed that day. A lot of folks were wanting to show up to see how the new preacher was going to handle communion, you know. And so that people just kept coming and kept coming. And Henry and I served the, the first two or three lines. And all of a sudden, that first tray of juice with the little shot glasses, it ran out. So Henry goes back up to the altar. He gets the second tray. There were only two trays. So he gets the second tray, and he follows me, and we're serving everybody, and we're looking at these, this juice, and we're worried because we weren't sure we were enough to serve everyone. And sure enough, it happened. We got down to the last person in that church who had come for communion. And we didn't have a cup of juice to serve. We ended up being one cup short of having enough. And folks, I felt terrible. I felt awful. I just looked at this man. I didn't know who he was. I'd only been there for a couple of weeks. I looked at this man. I said, sir, I am so sorry. And he looked at me with this somewhat disappointed look on his face. And he said, that's okay. That's okay. We went back. We covered up the communion service. I went over to the pulpit and I announced the closing hymn. And we ended the service that day. When the service was over, Henry Hansen, who had helped me serve, came up to me. He said, preacher. I said, yeah. He goes, it's your responsibility to recruit someone to help you serve communion. I'm sorry we didn't tell you that. And I said, don't worry. I won't, I won't make that mistake again. I'll be recruiting somebody. And then he looked at me. He said, I sure wish it wasn't Paul Mahaffey that we didn't have enough to serve. That name may sound familiar to some of you. I mentioned Paul Mahaffey in one of my sermons a couple of weeks ago. He was the man that uh, opened the administrative council meeting by praying, uh, God is great, God is good, let us thank you for our food. And then he looked at me and said, that's my way of telling you, don't ever call on me to pray out loud again. Henry said, I sure wish it wasn't Henry, uh, I sure wish it wasn't Paul Mahaffey that we didn't have enough to serve. And I said, why? He said, Missy, Paul Mahaffey hadn't liked a single preacher we've had ever since he's been here. Now I was terrified. Okay. I was terrified. So when I got home from church that day, the first thing I did was I called Paul Mahaffey. I called him and I said, Mr. Paul, I am so, so sorry that that happened today. I regret it so much. Please accept my apologies. And I hope you can forgive me. He said, preacher, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, I worried about it for three more weeks. I kept worrying about it. So three or four weeks passed, and it came time to get ready to serve communion that next month. So the first thing I did was I picked up the phone, and I called Paul Mahaffey. I said, Paul, I would feel tremendously honored if you would help me serve communion this coming Sunday. He said, no, preacher, I don't think so. I, you know, that's not my thing. And I thought, I've made him mad. He's going to hate me for the rest of my life. I said, Paul, please. Please, it would mean a lot to me. And I think it would mean a lot to the church as well. He said, well, all right, I'll help you. I said, good. But I could tell he wasn't too thrilled with it. Well, that communion Sunday rolled around. It came time to serve the sacrament. And I undraped the elements and I consecrated the elements. Then I turned and I invited Paul Mahaffey to come forward and help me. 
And you could see it in the faces of those people. Some of them were shocked. (laughs) Most of them were thrilled to see it happen. Paul came up and I took a piece of bread and I gave it to him. I said, Paul, the body of Christ broken for you. And then I picked up a cup and I handed it to him. And I said, Paul, the blood of Christ shed for you. Then I gave him a tray of the juice and I took the bread and we invited the people to come and the people started coming and we were serving them. I was serving them the bread, Paul was serving them the juice. When we finished, we went back up to the altar and I put the juice tray back down. I put the bread down and I turned to Paul and I said, Paul, thank you. And this is what he said to me. And I quote, You screwed up again, preacher. And I went, oh my gosh, what did I do now? He said, you screwed up again, preacher. I said, what? He goes, you didn't serve yourself communion. And I looked at him and I smiled. And I said, Paul, there's a reason I didn't serve myself communion. Because the last time I served myself first, we fell one cup shy of having enough for you. So I'm going to serve myself, Paul. But I wanted to make sure that everybody else was served first. And then Paul looked at me and smiled. He put his hand on my shoulder. He said, preacher, give me that bread. So I handed him the bread. He tore off a piece of that bread. And he handed it to me. And he said, preacher, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And then he reached down. He picked up a cup and he handed it to me. He said, preacher, this is the blood of Christ. Shed for you. And I partook of the sacrament. He went and sat down. But instead of going back. And announcing the closing hymn. I did something I had never done before. I knelt right there at that altar. And I prayed to God. And I thanked God for that experience of grace. That I had received from God. And that experience of grace that I had received from Paul Mahaffey. And ever since that day, every single time I have served communion, that's what I've done. I've always served myself last to make sure everybody else gets theirs. And I always kneel at that altar. And I pray with thanksgiving for the grace and the love. And for the forgiveness that I've been shown. Friends, as disciples of Christ. We are called to be imitators of Christ. As disciples of Christ, we... We are called to be imitators of Christ's grace. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to be imitators of Christ's forgiveness. And his acceptance. Who are we imitating with our lives each and every day? Are we imitating Christ? Or are we imitating enemies of the cross? Would you join with me in a spirit of prayer? Almighty God, your grace in our lives is experienced in so many ways. But mostly your grace 
we experience in the love and the care of others who are your disciples. We pray, oh God, that all of your children, regardless of who they are, we pray that all of your children would experience your grace, your love, your forgiveness, your acceptance, your embrace. Through each and every one of us. Help us, oh God, to be imitators of Jesus Christ. We pray this in His name. Amen. Our closing hymn is one of the great hymns of our faith. We probably could have just sung this hymn today and gone home. We're going to stand together now. We're going to sing the old rugged cross. And as we sing today, if you're here and you would like to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come forward as we sing. If you're here and you would like to unite with this congregation uh, by transferring your membership from another church, we invite you to come forward as we sing. In whatever way God's Spirit might be leading us to be imitators of Christ instead of imitators of the enemies of the cross. And whatever way God's Spirit is leading you to respond to that, I invite you to do so. As we sing now, the old rugged cross.
You know, folks, if you want to, you're welcome to come up here and take a look at this. You'll see what a beautiful head of hair I still have. But a lot of things have changed since this picture was taken. But there's one thing that has never changed. And that's what that cross means to us. The grace, the love, the acceptance, the forgiveness, the hope that became ours on that cross more than 2,000 years ago. It has never changed. It is still with us today. We know that, don't we? We know that. There are a lot of people in this world who don't. So it's up to us. It's up to us to share that grace and that love with them. It's up to us not to be enemies of that cross. It's up to us to be imitators of Jesus Christ. So to you, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, go in peace. Sin no more. Love God and serve God's people. Cross at the cross, I surrender.